Revelation 21 is our text for this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here and hope you'll come back and be with us when you have the opportunity. If you are uh, visiting especially from this area, we hope that you'll come back and uh, not be a stranger to us. Uh, Revelation 21, we looked at chapter 20 last time, not that we answered all the questions. I've, I've got more questions than I've got answers about that text, but we tried to suggest an interpretation that is consistent with the rest of the book and not something that uh, gets us off into some kind of future scenario about things that are hard to pin down. We suggested that uh, it is basically telling us the same story as the rest of the book has, although the way that is told might leave us uh, with a few things that uh, keep us guessing. Um, and I'm not you know, suggesting that uh, what I said about Revelation 20 last week is the final word on that chapter, but I do believe that something like that is the interpretation of that chapter, um, and I would like to think that I got maybe close to it. Uh, but the big finale is in chapter 21 and 22, as John shows us the final and ultimate re reward of the saints. Uh, the picture in chapter 20 is that their enemies are gone. We saw at the end of chapter 19 that the beast and the false prophet, which are the two beasts from Revelation 13, uh, they were destroyed, and then the power behind them is destroyed ultimately at the end of chapter 20. And so that brings us now to chapter 21, where the way is paved clear for the saints to receive their reward. Uh, we saw in the last part of chapter 20 a judgment and we suggested that that is probably meant to be understood as a judgment of the wicked, and uh, now it comes our turn to see the reward of the righteous. So with that kind of uh, background in mind, let's look at what John says. Verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, the first things have passed away." We well, can't read that text without getting the impression that God is obviously doing something brand new for his people here. And, of course, we understand this to be not just some kind of glorified description of the church uh, as it exists on earth, but that this is the reward uh, of our fellowship with God in heaven. Uh, John says that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, some of you may or may not know that there is more than one word in the Greek language for new, because there's more than one kind of new. And the word new in this particular text is the word that means new in quality. Not new in the sense of brand new in time, but new in the sense that nothing like this has ever been before. And so there is a new kind of heaven and a new kind of earth that is revealed here. And, of course, you can't help but hear the creation language. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now here we have a new heaven and a new earth. And so the picture is that God is making a new world for his people to live in. And the language, of course, is taken from Isaiah chapter 65. Uh, let's go back and look at that. We've got time to do that this evening. Uh, and notice, if you will, what uh, Isaiah was talking about. The language actually appears in two places, Isaiah 65 and 66. In 65, 17, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. And again in 66, 22, Just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. Now, when Isaiah originally penned those words, he was, I believe, speaking about God bringing the Jews out of captivity. And God was saying to them that it's going to be a new time when I do that. 
that it's going to be a new chapter in our relationship. It's not going to be the way it used to be. Remember that the Israel that had gone into captivity was faithless, they were idolatrous, they were wicked, they, they had no integrity about them, and God drove them out of his land and punished them. But God said, I've not done that to wipe you out, I've done that to purify you. He called his remnant back to him, and in that context, God says, we're going to start all over again, as it were. I'm going to make a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to start this relationship again, and it's not going to be like the old one. This time I'm going to have a people who are faithful to me and who love me and who will keep my uh, statutes and my covenant. Well, we all realize that the Israel that came back out of captivity proved to be not a whole lot better than the one that went into captivity. They had their share of shortcomings as well. And that helps us to understand that what God was talking about here was not ultimately just the Jews coming out of captivity, but it was a prophecy of the Messianic age in which God would begin again his relationship with man because the Messiah had made that possible by providing the forgiveness of sins. And that is the picture that John uh, sees in its final form here. Uh, a new heavens and a new earth, a completely new situation uh, in which to dwell. Uh, there's another text I want to uh, bring to mind, but we'll come back to that one in just a moment. Uh, for now, notice, if you will, what he says here, that the sea was no more. There was no longer any sea. Uh, we've seen the sea a couple times in the book. Um, 13.1, we saw the dragon standing on the sea. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the great multitude standing on a sea before. Uh, that would have been back in chapter uh, 7. But this idea of a sea in the Bible, uh, it's, a, it's a rather interesting image. Uh, the sea is an image of danger and death and evil in the Bible. And very often we hear about in the Bible God conquering the sea. And you have to think like the ancients did. The ancients were not seafaring, just loving the sea kind of people. The sea was a dangerous place. Ships were very small. They were not built very well in the ancient time. And it, it, you took your life in your hands to go out on the sea. And very often people who went out to sea never came back. It was always churned up and dangerous. And so the sea becomes a symbol of that which is evil and dangerous for man. And very often we hear in the Bible this language about God conquering it. Uh, sometimes the sea in the Bible is the barrier that separates God from his people. We saw that back as early as the throne scene in chapter 4, that in front of the throne of God, that there was something like a sea of glass like crystal. There is a separation between God and his people. And in 15.2, we saw that image as well, that... Uh, he said, I saw something like a sea of glass and those who had been victorious over the beast in his image standing on the sea of glass holding the harps of God. They're not all the way there yet in chapter 15, but here in chapter 21 they are because the sea is no more. The sea is a symbol of that which keeps God and his people apart, the enemy of God's people and just like it was in the Exodus, there was a sea that stood between God's people and Mount Sinai. And so what did God do? He split it in half, as it were. He divided it. He conquered it so that his people could pass through it. Well, that's the, the picture that John is conjuring up here as well, that there is no more separation. Nothing now keeps God and his people apart they are now in his presence. The sea is no more. Uh, you even see that kind of thing in the creation story. And there's something else. If you look at the way this text is put together, uh, you may recall uh, some of us studied this kind of thing in one of our previous classes, that it's not uncommon to see these texts arranged in this inverse parallel kind of way. And we have the new heavens and the earth corresponding to all things being made new in verse 5, 
Uh, we have the first heaven and the first earth. It said that they have passed away. And we get that language again in verse 4. The first things have passed away. And what is interesting is the parts that are C and C prime. That the absence of the C corresponds with the absence of death, sorrow, and pain. And that goes right along with what we've been saying so far, that these things that keep God and his people separate are now completely gone. There is no more death that holds God's people. There is no more torment being stuck in an earth full of unbelievers, and they are persecuted for their faith. All of that is gone at this point. The sea is no more. All of the problems, the obstacles... They're all gone. And so the picture that John is painting, therefore, is that they are now in the presence of God. Um, As we noted that this is suggestive of a new creation. And interestingly enough, John never uses the word creation here. He comes very close to it. He says it's a new heavens and a new earth. But you would expect him to say that God has now created all things again or created things anew, but he never speaks that way. Why not? Well, I think it has to do with John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, you remember how the Gospel of John begins? In the beginning was the Word. And you can't read the first verse of John's gospel without thinking of Genesis 1. In verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And what does Genesis tell us? That the earth was formless and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said what? Let there be light. Well, what John is saying in John chapter 1 is that that had happened again that the world had become engulfed in the darkness and the blackness of sin. And God was going to fix that. And so you don't read too very far into John chapter 1, in which we hear that in him was the life, and the life was the light of men. That God was sending his light into the world again, just like he had in Genesis chapter 1. that God did not want a world that was covered with sin and darkness. He wanted his world to be filled with light and life. And so when Jesus came into this world, that's when the fulfillment of Isaiah 65 and 66 began. We are now living in the time of the new heavens and the new earth. God has made a new world. He Not physically, obviously, but he has made a new situation for us to live in. The old world was characterized by sin and death, but we now live in a situation where there is life and righteousness, thanks to Jesus Christ. And so what John is trying to tell us in John chapter 1 is that when Jesus came into the world, the world changed. Drastically, a new situation was created with the work of Jesus. And I think maybe the reason that John never says here that God has created this new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 is that what heaven is going to be is simply the perfection and the fulfillment of what God has already started in Jesus Christ. And you might think, well, how does that exactly work? Well, it's, it's very simple. We have a relationship with God right now that is never going to end. It's only going to get better. We have a relationship with God right now in which we are separated from him by this body of flesh and we live in a material world. But when we get to heaven, uh, we're still going to have a relationship with God. It's just going to be closer and perfect nothing separating us. It's going to be the completion of what has already started. And that's what we get here in Revelation chapter 21. It's not so much that God is going to change everything, but rather he is going to bring it to its ultimate
fulfillment. We get that language in the New Testament all the time about how we are in the kingdom, and yet there is a sense in which we are going to inherit the kingdom yet, that we have the, the Holy Spirit as a pledge of our inheritance, a down payment, but we don't have the full thing yet. That's the same idea here, that we are already living in the time of the new creation, but its fullness awaits us. And so this is a better situation, uh, a new kind of fellowship with God, new in the sense that it is closer than we have ever had before. You'll notice here uh, also as we go along that in verse 2, uh, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And I don't think that John is saying that I saw the New Jerusalem in the new creation. I think the point is that the New Jerusalem is the new creation. And as we go on through this text, we're going to see here in uh, the, the next chapter, chapter 22, that when John gets to describing what he's seeing here, that in this city there is the tree of life, there is the river of life, the tree puts forth its fruit and the nations eat of it, and you can't help but look at that and say, that looks like the Garden of Eden. And that is exactly the point that we are supposed to get. That the new heavens, the new creation, is this place called the New Jerusalem, which is the situation that God had planned for us from the very beginning. To be in His presence in a place that keeps us alive forever, that is designed to be a place of rest for us where we can have our fellowship with God uninterrupted. Uh, you'll notice uh, what we have here in the new city, uh, as we look later on, is not a sea, but a river. There's a difference in the Bible. Seas are bad things, rivers are good things. Rivers are sources of life. And so... That's the point here in verse 2. The new city is the new creation. That's all that there is in the new creation, this city that God has prepared. And uh, you think about that as well. Uh, you know, we're used to cities. But the ancients, uh, you know, cities weren't, weren't as common in the world as they are for us. Uh, most people lived in farms. Uh, either as free people or as slaves. Uh, some people did live in cities, to be sure. But if you think about the biblical perspective, and you think about Israel, uh, especially Israel like in the book of Genesis or Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, Israel's story is a story of people who lived in tents, and even their temple was a tent. It was the tabernacle. And you think about that place in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, that Abraham lived like a sojourner in this world, wandering, and his children did as well because they were looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. The point John is making is that this is a permanent place. Unlike the temporary shelters that we live in in this life, this is a city. It's not a farm. You know, it, it's not a, a tent that God gives us, but a city, a permanent, eternal place to live with Him. Uh, and you'll notice that it says that uh, we have here this uh, new heavens and new earth, which is the new city. It is also described in verse 2 as like a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, it is the tabernacle of God that is among men. The imagery keeps changing, but the point of every one of those images is exactly the same, that God and His people are now together. Notice this new heavens and new earth um, What's the point of God making that? You read Genesis chapter 1. He makes heaven and earth so that man has a place to live. In that heavens and earth that God created, he made a garden where he walked in the garden and talked with Adam. 
Well, that's the point here, that God is making a place again where he can be with us. And it's a city, a place where people live together. It's like a bride, like a husband and wife in their love and their closeness uh, together. It's like the tabernacle in the Old Testament where God's tent was right in the middle of all the tents of his people. And so even though the imagery keeps kind of switching from one thing to the next, it's the point that, that we're ha- we've got the ultimate fellowship with God uh, described here. And I heard a voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Uh, we don't perhaps have time to look at all the passages tonight, but, but this is covenant language. If you read uh, back in the Old Testament, as God describes his covenant relationship with Israel and his covenant relationship with the new Israel in the Messianic age, this is the way that God talks about it, that I will be among my people. And you'll notice in the references here, Jeremiah 31, that's the passage that ends with God saying, days are coming in which I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, This covenant, renewed covenant, is going to be a time when God is going to be with his people. You remember later on in Jeremiah 31, God says, they will not teach each man his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the greatest of them to the least of them. And when God says that they will be my people, that means that they will be my only people. I'm not going to have any other people but these, and they're not going to have any other God but me. Uh, does somebody have a Second Corinthians six? Could somebody please go there and uh, look at that? Read that passage for us. Second Corinthians six, sixteen. Who's got that? Go ahead, James. In what agreement has the temple of God? I, you are the temple of the Lord of God. As God has said, I will go in it and walk among them. I will be their God. Now, Paul says that passage is already being fulfilled in the church, that we are the fulfillment of that passage. But again, there's an even greater fulfillment of it coming, that God is now among his people. We are the temple that God has made, Paul says in Ephesians 2 and 1 Corinthians uh, 3 and some other places. But in heaven, it's going to be an even closer relationship than we enjoy now. You'll notice uh, we're told here also that when God and his people get together in verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Remember who this book was written to. People who were going to suffer and who were wondering why does it have to be this way and can't God do anything about it? And John wrote this book to say God is going to do something about it. You're going to have to hold on and endure And if you'll be faithful, you'll be the winner. God is going to destroy your enemy. He's not going to do it this weekend or next weekend, but he's going to destroy your enemy. And so you hold on. Yes, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be hardship, but then there won't be. Wipe away every tear from their eyes. No longer any death. This actually comes from Isaiah 25, verses 6 and following that beautiful passage in Isaiah where uh, in the latter days God will prepare a lavish banquet for all the nations on this mountain and they will come and stream to this mountain, Isaiah says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye and he will remove the veil that is stretched over all the nations, that is death and and so forth. That's the language that uh, John is quoting here. And of course, Isaiah was looking at the Messianic age that in the Messianic age, God has broken the power of death by the resurrection of Jesus. He has caused us great joy for the forgiveness of our sins. But again, there's another ultimate level of fulfillment that is coming, and that is going to be in heaven with God. We see this kind of language throughout Isaiah, Isaiah 35, uh, Isaiah 65, again, in that same context of the new heavens and the new earth. Um, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. 
course, all of this is restoration language, that God's going to fix once and for all what the problem was, and it's never going to bother them again. Uh, Paul talks about this kind of thing uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as he talks about the end of the world and the resurrection. In verse 26, Paul says that the last enemy that will be abolished is death, and that's what we see here. There is no longer any death, mourning, crying, pain. All of those things that characterize this creation, uh, they will not be there in that one. Well, uh, verse 5, He who sits on the throne says, I'm making all things new, right for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost. Again, that's from Isaiah. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Uh, there in that context, God is talking about releasing his people from captivity. But again, that's just a model or an illustration of something else that God was ultimately going to do. Because the ultimate captivity that God's people are in is their captivity to death. And so God says, I'm going to take all of that away. I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to give my people what they need freely. It's not going to cost them anything. Um, this language is actually quite common uh, in the Bible. We see it in John chapter 4 where Jesus talks to the woman at the well about how if, you get, if you'll drink the water that I give you, you'll never get thirsty again. Uh, we hear this in Nehemiah and Isaiah. And in those contexts, God talking about a new exodus. You think about that. When God brought Israel out of Egypt brought them into the wilderness, but he gave them water along the way. Well, that's the picture here, that God is going to give us the water that keeps us alive, and it's going to be constantly and eternally available to us. So it is a picture of God satisfying every need that we have. Uh, verse 7, He overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Uh, Hosea 11, out of Egypt I called my son. I remember that in Jeremiah 31, the, the new Israel is referred to as God's child, God's son. Uh, but of course, this is also language that is used of Jesus in Psalm 2. Um, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And in Psalm 89, we hear that kind of thing as well. But perhaps the uh, passage that really comes to mind is 2 Samuel 7 and verse 14. That was where God and David were talking about the temple. David says, I want to build you a temple, God. And God says, no thanks, but tell you what, I'll build a house for you. And after you're gone, I will raise up your descendant after you. I will make him sit on my throne. He will be a son to me, and I will be a father to him. Now, of course, talking there about Solomon, but Solomon is, again, a type of somebody else. He's a type of the Messiah. And we hear this language again in Isaiah, Isaiah 55, that I will give to you the sure mercies of David referring back to his promise to make David's descendants his children. And God says in Isaiah, I'm going to keep that promise. Well, you hear it completed here in Revelation 20 in verse 7, that everyone who has a share in this city, it is said of them that God is my father, I am, he is my God, and I am his son. Uh, we get that language in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is our older brother in the family of God, and he is bringing us so that all of the sons and daughters of God will be together. That's the, the consummation that we see here. Uh, the one who overcomes is, of course, the one who gets this great privilege. 
You think about what John said in 1 John 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God, and such we are. Uh, think about what that will be like to be in heaven and to be called the sons of God. Uh, it really is a fascinating, wonderful thought when we think about it. Uh, this is for those who overcome, and that takes us back to what we heard in the letters to the churches, uh, where in chapters 2 and 3 we kept hearing about to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. So that's the picture. And if you don't want to be part of that after seeing that, then something's wrong with you because that's the best of everything right there. John says in verse 8 that if you're not going to be faithful, well, you're going to miss out on this. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, none of them get to be part of this. And... The question is sometimes, does this list have anything in common? The answer is yes, it does. That it is possible that these are all kinds of unfaithfulness or even compromise with the emperor cult. Cowardly. You think about that. Cowardly. In an age where you were asked, are you a Christian or are you not? And if you say yes, we're going to throw you in prison and execute you. You think there were some people that had problems with being cowards? Sure. Uh, how about the unbelievers, the abominable? Remember the word abominable is an Old Testament word for idolatry. People who go ahead and give in and worship the emperor as a god. Uh, god says, I'm not going to have any of those people. Immoral people, fornicators that is, that's an Old Testament image of unfaithfulness. Sorcerers, people dabbling in other the worship of other gods. Uh, idolaters, liars, people who don't admit that they are Christians, who deny it. All of these things could be simply ways that John has of describing people who would be unfaithful in this time of trial. Uh, he has to tell them that if you give in, you won't have any part in what we're looking at here. And so one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke and was saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So now we're going to get an even closer look. And again, this part of the book is laid out very carefully. Uh, we have the glory of God, the gates and the wall. And right in the center of all of this is this text about the measurements, which is kind of uh, uh, the point of all of this. Um, we don't have time to look at every detail but uh, verses 11 through uh, 13, we have the description of the city. Her brilliance is like a crystal clear jasper. And by the way, uh, in your English translation, some of those are guesses. Some of these uh, are Greek words that we really don't know what they're referring to exactly. But you'll notice in verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates. At the gates are 12 angels, names written on them, three gates on the east, three in the north, three in the south, three in the west. So three in each side of the city. The wall has 12 foundation stones. Uh, the point is that it is the most perfect and the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. That every way you look at this city, that there is just the, the symbolism of God, you've got multiples of three, multiples of 12. Remember, 12 is the number that represents God's people. And so this is God's people here, uh, the 12 stones and the 12 gates and all of that. The point is that this is where God's people have been called to live. And in verses 15 through 17, we get measuring going on. Uh, the city is measured and we've seen this before. In Ezekiel 40, remember that uh, the prophet measured the vision that he saw there. And the purpose was to mark out the boundaries, the, the difference between where the people were and where the enemies were, the holy place and the not holy place. And that's the idea here as well, that God is 
is measuring this off so that no enemy can ever get near to it. Uh, we saw that image before in chapter 11 that God was measuring His people as they were about to face persecution, but here they're going to be measured for the final time. Uh, also in Zechariah 2, we get a measurement because this is where God is going to live. And this also uh, pulls John into talking about the city's perfection. Uh, the measurements are rather interesting. If you have a New American Standard Bible, this is probably the point at which you ought to get you another one, uh, a different version, because the New American Standard Bible just completely messes this up. Verse 17, the New American Standard Bible says that he measured the wall 72 yards. Well, the number 72 is not symbolic of anything. If you look in the margin, though, it is what? 144 cubits. It's 12 times 12. That's what it ought to say. Now, why did they convert 144 cubits to 72 yards? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the translators believe that this is going to happen on this earth, and so they want you to know exactly how thick the walls are going to be. But that is not the point. This is the heavenly Jerusalem, and you know, seven, who cares? Seventy-two yards. It's one hundred and forty. It's twelve times twelve. And uh, you'll notice that we're told that everything in this place is the uh, the absolute uh, purest and the best. Verse sixteen: uh, the length is the same as the width. The length and the width and the height, they're all equal, 12,000 stadia, which is 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. You get all those numbers multiplied together and you get this 12,000 number. Notice he says there that the length and the width and the height of the city are all the same dimension, indicating that the city is a perfect cube. Now, there's one other thing in the Bible that is described as having the same dimensions, height, width, and depth, and that is the most holy place in the temple. It was uh, 10 by 10 by 10 cubits. Um, what's the point here? Well, the new Jerusalem is the new most holy place. As we're going to see later on that there is no temple in this city, but the city is the temple. God is the temple. You're in the temple when you're in this place. Um, as we said, the numbers are all multiples of 12, but the New American Standard Bible kind of ruins all of that. But if you're familiar with Solomon's temple, remember that there is the courtyard, there is the holy place, and in the back there is the most holy place that had the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God was on the Day of Atonement, and in that place, the height and the depth and the width were all the same dimension. That's the point that John makes here as well, that this is the new holy place. And uh, perhaps we don't think of cities the way the ancients did, but this is a drawing of, of what an ancient city would have looked like. And this would have been a fairly typical, this is the city of Lakish, but a lot of cities were like this. You see a wall going all the way around it. There are gates in this wall. In the middle of it is a temple. That's what an ancient city was like, and that's the kind of thing that John wants you to have in mind here. That there are gates here, but every one of the gates is made of pearl, and the foundation stones of the city wall are, are precious stones. It, it's the most beautiful place that you can imagine, where the most precious things to us are the rocks and the walls up there. And so if you can imagine the, the perfection and the elegance of this place. John says, I saw no temple in this place, verse 22. The Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple. What was the purpose of a temple? Well, it was very plain. That's where God was. And God wasn't everywhere. He was there. And if you weren't there, you weren't with God. But there's no place in the heavenly Jerusalem that you're not with God. 
and you don't have to go into the temple, you're with him already. And so he is the temple. And there is no need for a son there, even though this is a new creation. There's no need for a son because uh, the lamp is the lamb of God himself, the light of the world. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there is no night there, its gates will never be closed. Because there are no enemies. In the ancient world, you close the city gates at sundown. You open them again at sunrise to keep spies and things like that from coming into the city. Well, no need to close these gates because there are no enemies. And uh, no night there, um, contrasting to the former picture of the darkness that covered the world before there is never going to be any darkness because there's no sin in this place. And a couple times we're told here that the nations will bring their glory into it. And the idea is that the glory of God is so overwhelming that nobody there will claim to have any. That whatever sense of pride that you have or accomplishment or glory or, or anything like that, that when you're in the presence of God, you will say, you know what, I'm nothing. And if anybody here has glory, it's God. And he deserves all of what I have. And, and it will be this emptying of self in the presence of God. There will be no rival kingdoms. There will be nobody there competing for attention with God. All will have surrendered all to him. And nothing unclean will ever get into it. Uh, no one who practices abomination lying again, probably descriptions of Christians who had compromised their faith, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the kingdom of God is now complete. All its enemies are, are conquered. Its spoil, its glory is taken into Jerusalem and God is glorified in his people. We'll look at the last part, uh, chapter 22, next time. Do you have any questions or observations? But I think we've looked at here. What a beautiful picture this is. All right, then, uh, chapter 22 next week.